The Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Okay, right, let's get started. Uh, it's another vaccination talk. Today we're here with Carol Subcheck. Uh, he is a co-founder and uh, software engineer at Starburst, one of the main companies that's backing the Trino project. Uh, prior to that, he worked at Teradata and because he was part of the team at Adapt, was the company founded by Dana Body that got bought by Teradata. Um, and then he started working on, on Presto, which later became Trino um, at Teradata. So uh, if you have any questions for Carol as he gives this talk, please unmute yourself, say who you are and, and ask your question. And feel free to do this anytime so he's not talking by himself. And we have to say that Carol is in Poland right now. So it's 10, 30 at night. So we appreciate him being, being here with us. And we also appreciate him going to, uh, getting through this while sick. And I would say he is vaccinated. I am. Uh, okay, okay. So, so my name is Carol Sobczak. Uh, yes, I, I was one of the initial employees of uh, Starburst. Uh, and I will talk about Star Wars Trino query optimizer on the engine, how it evolves over time, what are the reasons Trino exists, and so on. So, so first I will go over the company overview, then I will go over the Trino overview, then I will go over the evolution of the optimizer and the uh, milestones of how optimizer was evolving uh, in the last years. Um, I will also talk about other key features that we have, like dynamic filtering, advanced push down, and uh, importantly, I would also I would I will also talk about uh, the current initiatives that we have uh, for the future and for for the current developments. So, so the history of Trino actually starts in 2013, and even slightly before. Uh, in 2013, Facebook did open source Presto, and Presto was created uh, as a replacement for Hive at Facebook because Hive was too slow. Uh, Hive uh, syntax was not a SQL standard. So uh, there was a project initiated at Facebook, which was uh, then open sourced. Then in 2015, uh, Teradata joined the party and started cooperating on, on Presto. Uh, and I was part of that team. Uh, then by 2017, there was uh, 180 plus releases already, 50 plus contributors, 5,000 commits. Then at 2017, uh, at the end of the year, Starburst was founded uh, by the former employees of Teradata and Facebook. Uh, and then we had a couple of uh, series of founding. We had an A series in 2019 and uh, we had also we also had a B series in summer 2012 uh, 20. Um, ah, yeah, we also had C series. So we also we actually became a unicorn at that time. Uh, 2021 was also a year where we renamed rebranded from Presto SQL uh, into Trino. So here are some key employees that were part of the founding team. There's three gentlemen at the bottom, uh, Martin Traverso, Dane Sandstorm, and David Phillips uh, were the, are the original uh, creators of the, uh, of, the, of the Presto. So on board, we have uh, all the major contributors. Uh, and uh, yeah, we also have the original creators. So, so it's a very good team. Uh, okay, so uh, why actually Trino was created, right? I said that it was slower than Hive. Uh, that's, that's true, but there is also another reason. So if you, if you look at the companies today, a lot of the companies, um, in order to get the data, to get some insights from the data, they have to create expensive ETL pipelines. So for example, you have to have a team of data engineers and data scientists that uh, create pipelines for you. Um, that takes time. Uh, you have a lot of 
data duplication. So it's, it's harder to, to, to know what's the, the, the golden source of your data, the golden copy. Uh, this is complex, so you can imagine that it might take for some companies a lot of time to actually get some basic insights. So this is this is not perfect, uh, and hence their their Trino was created also. So you can you can treat Trino as your um, single point of access to data. So instead of um, Instead of creating detailed pipelines, you can actually uh, you can actually set up your data sources within Trino, and you can uh, query data when it leaves. So, so Trino is a federation engine. Uh, more imp also importantly, uh, you can have a lot of data sources, but Trino is also a very capable distributed system. Uh, which supports high concurrency, you know, massive, massive scale. Uh, so we also have a very good support for the uh, lake houses. So you can join your, let's say, some kind of remote data or some relational data from some relational data sources with your, let's say, newest lake house data. So we put a lot of effort within the project to have uh, good APIs for connectors. Connector is a component that essentially represents a data source. Uh, there is a lot of APIs that Connector can implement. Uh, some of them are obligatory. So uh, what happens is that on the coordinator, uh, there is a metadata API where, where Connector can tell the engine to the, to the planner, uh, what are the tables, what are the column types, what are the columns. There is also, you know, you can do access control this way. Um, so there is also, for example, data location API where you collect the engine where the data is actually living. Uh, and then on the workers, there is a stream API where, which actually is responsible for reading the data from the data source. So connectors and API are the first class citizen. Uh, even for the distributed connectors, like the lake house connectors, like Hive tables, for example, or, or AWS Blue tables, that's also a connector. Uh, and here is an example. Here are the examples of the connectors that are that we have. Uh, some of them are open source. Some of them are uh, Starburst connectors with, the, with some proprietary features, uh, like improved performance or, or improved security. Uh, you, you can see that we can connect to almost anything that makes sense to connect with. Um, yeah. So, but, but because of this uh, federation uh, approach, it has its challenges. So within a single engine, we have to deal with relational versus non-relational data sources. So with this comes the complexity of managing different data types, like you can imagine that all of the sources, they have kind of same data types, but kind of different. So one example would be the decimal types, for example. We have some semantics within Trino, but some databases have a different semantics and we have to adjust for that. Another complexity comes from the fact that the storage is externally managed. So <laughs> we have to carefully craft the uh, API for connectors to tell us what the storage is, like what are the properties of the storage, the storage, uh, like partitioning or bucketing and so on. Uh, there is no such thing like a built-in storage within the engine, like all of, all of it is connector. Uh, and another difficulty comes from the, from the statistics. So uh, as you probably know, statistics are very important for optimal performance of, of the engine. And uh, some connectors, provide better statistics, some provide, some provide worse statistics, and we have to deal with, with, with them. Even we have to be able to make some decisions even if the statistics are not that great. Uh, there is a problem with predicate push down. So when you push down predicate to your relational data source, for example, Oracle, it might have a different, different collation than, than Trino. So we have to adjust for that. A similar problem comes from the predicate extraction when the database describes the table, uh, also could be a problem of collation and so on. Uh, 
yeah, we, we have a support for the operator push down, which has to be modeled in a generic way across connectors. Um, we also have a advanced dynamic filtering, which I will get to later. Important thing is that um, we can do kind of a joint push down between connectors. So this is pretty cool because you can have join between different data sources like, I don't know, like let's say, um, hive meta hive tables compared to joint with the oracle tables and you can do simulated push down of join via the dynamic filter so i, I will get to that in the later slides so let's now okay. go over the quick, quick question can you like for those joins across different disparate sources they all have to come back up to the trino execution engine like you can't tell like Whatever this this and this data source is then data directly to this other data source and have it do the join there. Yeah, I mean join is still being executed in the uh, at the tree node, right? But with okay. dynamic filtering, we can skip a lot of data from the source, so we can uh, there will there will be a slide where I show how much gain you get by by doing that. So yeah. we don't have to fetch everything from the source connector; we just can fetch. The rows that are actually joined later on, right? So this is a, this is a huge improvement. Okay. So uh, let let me go over the, the major breakthroughs over the time that happened within the engine. So in the early stage, early stage, that is that's a, that are the optimize. This is the optimizer. This is how the optimizer looked like in the early days. So uh, every optimization we had was based on the transformation. Uh, so. The transformation is a visitor where you visit all of the nodes. If you apply some optimization, you have to traverse the plan to the place where the optimization happens. Then you rewrite the plan and all the nodes uh, upwards uh, of, the, of the node that changed. So as you can imagine, this is expensive to, to evaluate. Uh, and other problems are that there are some optimization paths where you have to apply the same optimization multiple times, uh, or even you know, undefined number of times, and because the transformations are expensive, uh, it's not feasible to do. Uh, and this is the one of the limitation. Uh, another problem is that um, yeah, I mean it's hard to add new operators because if you add the new plan node, then you have to rewrite all of the optimization rules. You have to add the support for the visitor in, the, in all of the optimizations. This is really painful. Uh, but you know, transformation-based model has some advantages. So it's easy to compute properties because it's a simple recursion. So we go down the plan and you, for example, if you want to compute partitioning properties, you, you implement a simple recursive visitor and you, you know, we go down and evaluate what's the property of a given plan node. So that's simple. Uh, so this is an example of the case where you would like to apply the same optimization multiple times, and it's kind of non-deterministic how you how many times you would like to apply the optimization. Like so, you have a simple join, for example, where between two tables, table A and table B. On table A, uh, A dot X uh, has a predicate connector can tell you that values for a, a dot x will be greater than 100. So what you can do is you, you can apply predicate push down. So you can push this predicate to the other side of the join. So now you can say b dot y is greater than 100. Uh, so that's good. And then what you can do is that you can actually push down this predicate, the connector itself. Now what can happen is that the connector that provides table b can actually tell you that the predicate is actually narrower. Uh, and this might happen, for example, when you have a partition table uh, with a lot of partitions. So what we usually do is that we avoid enumerating all of the partitions uh, at the planning time without any predicate, because that's expensive thing to do. Uh, but once we get some predicate, we can actually enumerate the partitions. So it might happen that you know, the, the predicate for B, but Y is actually narrower. And you might apply predicate push down again, uh, and then you can push the same uh, a dot x greater than 200. You can push push it down to to the left side of the join again. Uh, 
So, you know, and there might be multiple steps like that. Um, you, it's, it's hard to define how many times the rules should be, the transformations should be executed. So, uh, okay, so another uh, neat thing that was early in 2016 was the equality inference. So example of that is that, again, you have a join, you have a rather complex filter on top, uh, uh, a.x applied to f applied to g, and join itself can be complex, like uh, it can be, it is a function on the left and uh, column reference on the right. So with a predicate push down, you can actually push down the filter, the original filter to the left side of the join. However, you can also push down modified filter to the right side of the join because you can derive uh, more equalities. Uh, and you can say that, that B dot Y applied to G is actually uh, the same as uh, A dot X applied to F applied to G. So uh, we generate this cloud of, of, of equalities and try to derive, um, uh, let's say, transitive uh, predicates this way. So what happened uh, also in that year, that was mainly driven by Teradata, uh, we were adding support for different types. So we had a support for character type, float, decimal, for parametric types. Uh, and very importantly, we had the support for correlated subqueries. Uh, the goal was to have a support for full TPC DS, TPC DH uh, query suit. So now you, I mean, we wanted to be able to run them without any modifications and that was achieved uh, so we, we really we had suffered for all the queries early uh, as compared to competition um, uh, yeah and and we still progress right so that we added some support for created sub queries at that time we continue adding support for different more trickier say created sub queries there were other kind of uh, neat things added in the recent years. So this is still moving forward. Uh, okay, and at some point uh, in 2016, we switched to rule-based optimizer. So instead of transformations, you now can define a rule uh, where there is a pattern, uh, the rule is applied to a plan node that matches the pattern. Uh, the pattern can be quite, quite complex, as you see here. Uh, and this has this advantage that, that now you can uh, execute a rule multiple times as, as long as they are needed because they are quick to execute. Uh, you only change the sub, subset of the plan. You don't have to modify the entire plan. Uh, you only apply the rule locally. Um, and it's make, it makes it easier to add new plan plan nodes because the rules don't have to implement the visitor. Yeah, but this is, those are the advantages. The disadvantages is that it's harder to evaluate uh, properties. So let's say you want to check what is the partitioning for a given plan node. Uh, with transformations, you could do the simple recursion. With the rule-based approach, you have to be more, 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 more clever about this and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there is a concept of trades and propagation rules. So we still don't have concept internally of, of trades within the Trino. Uh, this concept will be required once we move away from the greedy optimizer. So that's another thing. Right now, our optimizer is a greedy one. So once you apply the rule, that's the way you go. We don't keep the old version of the plan uh, in, in memory. Uh, so that could have an issue that we might end up with, with a, let's say, suboptimal plan globally, even though it's optimal locally. And this is an example. So on the left, you have a some join order. On the right, you have some join order. Uh, okay, globally, locally, the left join might be better, join order. But if there is some kind of a group by or aggregation on top, it might be better actually to do the right version of the plan because uh, there is a different partitioning at the end of the join, on the, on the top join, right? So there is a part partitioning of data by a.x. So if you have an aggregation of, of a on a.x, on a 
you don't have to reshuffle the data again. So, so this is why why we will probably move to the non greedy optimizer in the, in the future. Um, okay, so in, then in 2017, uh, there was um, a cost based optimizer added. Also, that was uh, our little Teradata Office initiative. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, our our John, our, our John in reordering algorithm can do works on statistics and costs. And we choose, uh, we, we switch between automatically, we switch automatically between repartition and versus broadcast join. We also change join, join sides. We also have a full join reordering support so we can generate push trees. Uh, we work on statistics. So mainly we work on number of rows, number of distinct values, nodes fraction, min max, average data size. From the statistics, we compute the cost of CPU, memory, and network. And we compare uh, we compare plans and choose the plan with lower cost with some weights applied to different to the CPU man, memory and network. So um, yeah, this is an example of how the filter estimation works. If how you have you a pick... line, oh, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt, Carol. How do you pick the weights that you apply to CPU memory and network? Uh, it's, it's an arbitrary one. Uh, I don't recall the well, it's not fully arbitrary, sorry. I don't recall the exact values, but um, we put emphasis on the uh, uh, CPU, if I recall correctly, I would have to check, but mainly Presto uh, query performance is mainly limited by CPUs for, for, for three, no, sorry. So um, by putting weight on CPU, we choose plans where we have to do less computations and to reduce wall time. So, uh, yeah, I, I would have to check exactly, but I think we put the biggest weight on CPU. And I mean, other I mean, than that, it's, go ahead. I, I guess the question is like, and maybe Jim's asking this, like, um, is, like, I guess what percentage of the queries are using the different connectors that are going at these other different database systems? versus like the Trino native storage. What percentage could you could you elaborate so, a bit more? So like so we have a connector for single store like and so how often are people trying to federate queries across single store and then you know S3 buckets or something like that. And I guess maybe maybe Jim's not asking this or I'm asking this, but like single store is almost like a black box for you guys. How would you account for a CPU of whatever single store is going to do? Oh, or are, is it, or is these are these weights just for the Trino Trino based operations? So, so the, it's more about the cost of the join, really. Uh, okay. We have now support for the operator push down, uh, but I don't think it uh, it's at the discretion of of the, of the connector to push it or not. So it's not expressed in the, like Trino does not compare the, <coughs> the, the plans with the operator push down to the, for example, relational uh, database. We assume that by pushing things like aggregation down to relational data source, we will reduce the cost, overall cost of the plan uh, because you reduce the amount of data that is being transferred over the network. So what happens in practice is that while, uh, once we start extracting data from relational data database, for example, Oracle or other, or Teradata, for example, in a distributed way, those databases tend to put high cost. They, they, they getting the data from them is actually quite expensive. So if you can reduce the amount of data that is being produced by the, by, by the connector, it's good. By relational connector, it's good. For the data lake host connectors like Hive metadata, Hive tables, uh, it's, it's more about join order. Um, so there you, 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 scan, you, you scan the same tables. This cost does not change. The costs change once you start reordering the joins, right? So. It's more about that uh, than. Okay, so so to repeat, just saying, if it's connector, you don't account for CPU cost. It's just like how much it's the data transfer coming out of it. 
Yeah, that's 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 uh, yeah, that's that's like uh, that's an empir empirical experience, I would say. Okay. Yes. And so, then maybe, so maybe maybe what Jim is asking is okay for the Trino operators. You have these arbitrary weights. It sounds like they're set by hand. You're not like running like DB2 runs micro benchmarks to figure out what the CPU cost is. You're not doing any of that. It's just oh a, a, no no uh, that was quite a long time ago. But I I, I recall that we uh, we run the benchmarks and we try different weights uh, and the, the the weight where you put the most on CPU uh, is the best one for. For let's say TPCDS, TPCH, TPCDS, TPCH. Uh, I don't know, but, but to be clear, like that, it's a you ship Trino with that value hard coded as a it's, a it's a knob you can tune, but it's not like it you is. turn the system right. So it's like in DB2, you turn the system on. I see IBM people here; they can correct me. Uh, you turn DB2 on, and it runs micro benchmarks on your CPU, almost like Bogo Mix, to figure out what the weight should okay. be for the cost model. So, uh, so. There is an idea. It's, it's not. Uh, it's not in progress yet. But there is an idea. Actually, I will talk about this in the future. Uh, future uh, initiatives. So you can actually improve statistics. For example, by computing the collecting the data from the queries uh, and comparing the statistics of, for the plan against the actual statistics of the query. Right. So now you can actually have a better model where you uh, can apply some techniques like, I, I would guess, uh, linear regression or things like that, where you can uh, adjust this weight so that they match reality for the particular customer. Uh, the question is how much you gain from that really in practice uh, versus the heuristics. The, or, uh, but but yeah, that's that's an idea, and that's actually quite interesting project to work on. Uh, mm -hmm. It would be so so yeah. Like what we uh, it, it it we cannot easily like statistics are are not you, to get the actual stats. You have to run the query, right? So statistics are just an approximation of the reality. Uh, so hence hence you will need these weights. However, you can apply these weights. You can change these weights according to the workloads of the customer, for example. Uh, but for this, you need to have the, the history of the queries. You need to have this, this algorithm. So, so this is this is really something we've been thinking on. Of uh, yeah, is that does that uh, answer your question? Answers yeah. my question. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, Jim, I, I, I hijacked your, your question. So if you're satisfied, that's good. I was able to do what you're describing, Carol, also sounds like DB2 Leo, the, the learning optimizer stuff from 20 years ago. Okay, yeah. Like a, a lot of the techniques here are, yeah, like, they, they come from, from past. Um, yes, yeah, uh, to be clear, I'm not saying like, oh, that's a bad idea, don't do that. Like, or IBM invented, therefore you can't do it. I just think like what you're describing is pretty similar to what IBM had done. Yeah, so the, good idea. Again, the, the difficulty here is that we are operating on a federated environment where we miss some data. So um, from the connectors, for, for example. So in reality, sometimes some simpler approach works better than the more, more sophisticated one because, or maybe as good as the more sophisticated one uh, because uh, you know, reality is, is is not like your model, statistical model is 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 inherently inherently inaccurate because it assumes some data distribution and so on. So sometimes simple techniques work good enough. Uh, okay, so like let me continue. So this filter estimation, for example, what we here here is an example of if you apply a filter or item greater than zero, then what we keep in the stats. Is okay. There might be 61 million rows, but we know that item cannot be null. Similarly, if if you have a filter item equals to uh, 106, 100,000, 106, 106, then you might not learn that there is only 3,000 of rows and one distinct value. Similarly, when you have in clause that could be 6,000 of rows and two distinct values. So yeah. So what we do is that. 
one, one of the optimizations we do is that we choose join type. Uh, on the left, you can see that both tables are reshuffled, uh, but one table is really small, so our, our CBO will actually choose broadcast join type and the left table doesn't have to be reshuffled anymore. This is a typical um, situation uh, for dimensional tables, for example. Uh, so, so yes, you save a lot this way, a lot of CPU, a lot of network. Similarly, we can you can choose the small table to be the right table because the right table is kept in memory. It's an index for the join, so we, you want the small table to be kept in memory. Uh, we do full join reordering. What usually happens is that the the biggest table uh, and the join that does not filter on the data will be on the top, because if it does not filter on the data, this it will increase the volume of data. Uh, so it's better to put it after all of the filtering. Uh, so here the line item table is left on the left on the topmost join. So it's not in memory, not being not being kept in memory. If you apply a filter to line item table, then uh, it, it might only produce 3000 of rows. So then it becomes right bottom most uh, table uh, and then customer table landed on the top here. Yeah, so this is how it will work. We also support the full bushy trees. So usually, I mean, usually some, some, some engines, I think they, they only do deep, left deep or right deep join orders. Uh, we do support bushy, bushy trees if that's better in terms of cost. Uh, and CBO was a great breakthrough. Uh, we decreased increased performance by uh, uh, orders of magnitude. Uh, yeah, that was the first great improvement. Uh, yeah, but like I, like I mentioned before, accuracy 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 decreases with plan depth. If you have more complex time plan, then the more operators you have to for the, the more operators you have to compute stats for, uh, the error increases. Uh, and that, that's one, one problem. Another is that some connectors don't provide accurate uh, number of distinctive values, which is essential for computing filtering ratios. Uh, sometimes we only know table sizes. So what we can do is that we apply different techniques to deal with that. We normalize statistics. If, for example, stats say that there is more number of no more distinct values than number of rows. We cap number of distinct values. Um, we assume predicates are correlated. Uh, we assume distinct values match. Uh, correlated predicates mostly for join. Uh, we, we assume that I will get to that uh, next slides. Uh, we also can fall back to table size statistics only for join type site selection. So. Um, yeah, so we assume distinct values match when you write a query where you join by two columns like a dot x uh, equals to b dot y. We assume that the table with smaller, with smaller number of distinct values that from that table, all of that distinct values will have a corresponding match on the other side of the join. Uh, and this is based on the, the, the fact that when user does join table, he really means to get some data. So we assume that there are matches instead of not having matches at all. This is the only reasonable thing to do. Uh, we also assume that the predicates are correlated for join. When you have a join with two equi clauses, this is example from one of the TPCTS queries. We, what we do is that we assume they are correlated. So we choose one of the clauses as a driving clause and we compute filtering ratio for that clause. And we also have um, other auxiliary clauses. And we apply constant filtering coefficient for those other uh, clauses. So this gives uh, better results um, in for, that this results in better plans. And this is again, this this is an example of this, you know, simple yet very efficient optimization that works good in practice. Uh, and it's not too sophisticated. So uh, there, is, there is plenty of such tricks. 
Uh, uh, another important improvement uh, optimization is that when you don't know the statistics, uh, detailed statistics of the table, it might be that some connector does not return table size at all, but the other does actually say, the other connector tells you that the table has 100 kilobytes. So in this example, there is a join with table B, which has a size of 100 kilobytes. The, other, the size of the other table is unknown. What we do is that we, since the B table is really small for a typical Trino cluster, uh, we choose that B table to be the build side of the join. It is on the right side of the, of the, of the join. This is a big win often because um, the join is replicated. Uh, and uh, also we can derive dynamic filtering, uh, dynamic filters, uh, so, so runtime predicates if, if there is not too many distinct values. Um, this, is, this, this helps in practice. Uh, some, some customers don't collect statistics. Like statistics, you have to ask, you, you, have to, you, you don't have to assume, but some, uh, sometimes statistics are not up to date. Some, some customers might not run analyze frequently. There might be new partitions with, with new data, and you might not get statistics for this. So we have to deal with this, this, with this edgy situations. Uh, okay, so another big breakthrough was adding of dynamic filtering. So dynamic filter is a predicate that we derived from, from the join, uh, from the right side of the join, so from the build side, from the index, uh, that happens at the run, run time. That uh, predicate is then being uh, pushed to the left side of the join, either to the uh, streaming source or to the file enumeration of the connector. So dynamic filtering is an umbrella keyword. There is a lot of techniques behind that. There is a node local dynamic filtering. There is a partition pruning. There is dynamic row filtering. And there is awaitable dynamic filters. Uh, one important thing is that uh, the, the project was driven by community. There was, uh, I think, three companies involved. Uh, so this was a great example of the community-driven work with the cooperation from the different parties. Um, so uh, what, have, what we added first was the support for no local dynamic filtering, right? So once you, when you have a join uh, and join is running, a join operator is running on the same node as the table scan, uh, you, what you can do is once the join gets the index, so data from the right side, uh, you can extract predicate from that uh, build side of join from the index and push that data, push that predicate to the uh, table side, table scan on the left. All happens within a single node. Uh, and this helps with uh, stripe running in RSC parquet files. So parquet and RSC files have internal indexes uh, and you can apply predicates on them to skip data within these files. Uh, so this has this, this this there was some improvements from this. It was not that dramatic, but but yeah, there are some queries that improve. Uh, then we added support for dynamic partition pruning. So similarly, you collect predicate at runtime from dynamic uh, from the join from the join build side. Then the Predicate is being sent to the coordinator. Uh, coordinator then uh, propagates the filter to the uh, left table scan, but it uh, gives the filter to the split uh, enumerator. So a split enumerator is an API for listing, uh, let's say, files from the table. Uh, so if you have a connector that it has a partition data, it can take the predicate that it can, it can completely skip, skip the partition, completely skip the files from the partitions that won't be read. So, and this is a huge win. This was a big, this was a, a big improvement compared to uh, like to, to what was before. Uh, I would say that was uh, in total comparable to maybe yeah, to CBO. Um, a lot of queries improved a lot. 
this is like a zone like, map where they, there's something there's some metadata about the partition that says I know I know there's nothing in here that I need. Yeah. So so uh, in, if if you have a lake house connector, for example, because uh, dynamic partition pruning works mostly for the lake house connectors. Uh, they know the structure of the tables. They know the partitions. They know the values of the partitions. Once they get the dynamic filter, they can apply it to the partition listing. So they can skip the files completely. So you don't even you don't even start processing the files in the nodes. I understand. Okay. Um, and one of the reasons uh, dynamic filters were improved over time. We reduce the latency of how quickly dynamic filters are populated to the coordinator. We also added a, a feature, a feature for. We also added a, a way to wait for dynamic filters, so await double dynamic filters. So now the connector can actually wait for the future uh, when the filter is ready, uh, and this is important for relational connectors. If you have an Oracle connector, for example, uh, you only have one chance to apply the filter. Uh, because the way we read data from the Oracle connector or other relational connectors is that we submit a query to the source database and we get the data, right? So you can do this only once. Uh, so connector can now wait for the filter for some predefined amount of time. Uh, and once the filter is ready, it can uh, improve the query that is being submitted to the source database. And this is an example of how Oracle Connector did improve. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that was uh, that's a huge improvement for the federated case. Uh, it's like a night and day for some queries, like some customers, uh, it actually, it was, uh, some customers have like, um, we have a support for dis distributed uh, connectors, distributed, distributed relational data sources. Uh, it's kind of irrelevant, but the thing is, for, for some customers, I think this was the change some, some queries from hours to, I guess, minutes or maybe less. So this was an enabler uh, for the federated case. But um, does that sometimes make the queries that you push down just enormous? Like with in clauses that are hundreds of thousands of uh, elements mm, wide? No, no, no. We have a limit, very low limit actually, on how many individual values you can push. So uh, I run benchmarks on that. And uh, at some point, if you push the many values, you might get some regressions if you don't utilize dynamic filter. So, uh, so when, when I was tuning this, uh, I set the threshold for waiting for dynamic filter and a threshold for the size of dynamic filter so that there is no regression, but you still get huge gains. Uh, usually it's quite low, uh, but the thing is, if you, a typical case, you have data partitioned by uh, dates. So, uh, and that's, you know, well, that's, I guess that's the most common case you, you, you have. And uh, what happens is that one, once we, while we build, while, while we when we detect the dynamic filter is too big, we actually simplify it. So we extract the min max range. And since the days are incremental and you know they are kind of nice for that, you you can you still get a huge boost. Uh, and just that case is, is, is a normal scale. So you don't get a regression, but you can you get huge gains. And uh, there are some ideas how to potentially improve this for, for large dynamic filters. You could create a temporary table, uh, but for now it's, it's, uh, we, we, it's enough that what we do here. Uh, okay, thank you. So another big uh, improvement was the advanced predicate pushdown. Before 2019, we had support for predicate pushdown and column pruning. Now we have support for operator pushdown, projection pushdown, uh, with the reference projection. I will get to that in a moment. Uh, we have a support for limit pushdown, aggregation pushdown, joint pushdown, top and pushdown, and it's it's growing. Aggregation pushdown is again probably one of the more important the pushdown for the relational connectors. 
here is an example of the drifters pushed down. Uh, a typical case for the lake house, lake house storage is that uh, customers keep data in structure types. Uh, the structure types are stored, the structure data is stored in Parquet on ORC, for ORC files, typically Parquet. Parquet does keep the uh, structure types. Let's say it's a, it's a row type or a map type. Uh, there are actually uh, vectorized data within Parquet for, let's say, key and values or for each uh, row column. So within the Parquet files, there's only vectorized data. So what we do now, if you write a select call uh, dot field zero from table, we will push down that projection into the connector. Uh, so uh, connector can now uh, skip loading of the entire uh, structure, structure, but can only lead that particular field. So this is an example. We have a projection that will decode only field zero from the structure, structure type. There is a table scan that reads the entire structure um, structured uh, column, but after projection push down, there is just table scan which produces field zero. So we don't read uh, all of the structure blocks, let's say. And this is an example of API uh, of the projection push down. What is important is that uh, we carefully design the API so that. We don't really expose too many details about the optimizer to the connectors. So we have an abstraction called the connector expression. Uh, right now is either a constant field reference or a variable, which is variable is essentially a column reference. But the, the, the way it's done, it makes us easier to change how the optimizer works, uh, how we model the, how model the plan internally. So it's, it's a good thing to do. Uh, we don't have to deal with the, um, you know, um, uh, backward compatibility too much here uh, when we change optimizer. Uh, okay, so uh, what we are working on right now and what we will be working in the future. So, okay, so there, there is a couple of interesting projects here. Um, so, for example, uh, there is a, an idea for, for caching. We actually started working on that. So what you can do is that uh, Trino now has a support for materialized use. We have an API for that. Uh, we actually uh, at Star Wars have a um, implementation of materialized use. Uh, there is also an idea to have a, a caching of the intermediate results uh, of the plans. So what you can do is that you can, if you have a query, there is a query on the left here, join. Uh, that can be uh, that can also be just part of the query of the bigger plan. What you can do now is that you can compute the signature of the of the join here of the join of the, of the plan that starts with the join here, and you can compare that signature against the let's say cached data. And if you detect that signature matches, you can actually replace your entire plan section with the already pre-calculated data. So in this case, uh, let's say signature matched with this plan signature A, which is a cache table A, uh, and that could be a join from table A and table B. However, you can see that there is no filter here and there is a filter here on the left. Uh, so you, what you can do is that you replace um, that entire plan with, with table scan on A and filter on top. Um, and yeah, and this can be. Uh, this is a neat trick. You can you can do let's say caching between queries. You can create materialized views. Like if you are a data engineer, you can create materialized views from your federated data, or maybe from expensive lakehouse queries where you take immediately take advantage of the of the performance boost this way, right? Because your data is already you kind of transparently cache your data for your use cases. Uh, so another uh, another project we start. Go ahead. Your materialized views, though, they can't be automatically maintained, right? You have to. Somebody has to say, "Go, go regenerate," because you. Uh, that... They are they are maintained automatically, right now. So we are thinking about. Uh, they, you can define the schedule. You can define incremental, non-incremental materialized views. We are thinking about uh, having a full CDC, so the change uh, detection. Okay. 
uh, API within Trino. Uh, but, right. but they so, are. Like I was saying, if someone inserts into Postgres and that's a connector, unless you have a trigger set up to tell Trino this thing got modified, you guys, you, you have to refresh manually. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's that's one way to do that. But there is also, there is also I would say, maybe a simpler solution. You can actually, well, since you are upgrading, you are keeping some state of your materialized view. You know what state it is, what 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 data is inside. So you can do a union between your source and your materialized view. So what you only read from the source is the hottest new data, and you merge that with already cached data. Uh, so this is another thing uh, we have on the table. We will see where this goes. Uh, we we kind of apply that uh, work based on like. Also, what what customers on customer feedback, right? We we can do that. We don't do that yet, but uh, there there is with materialized views. Depending on the schedule, there might be some lag right now. So, okay. uh, yeah. Right. Another project we started is the uh, we we started the project to improve fault tolerance for Trino for longer um, workloads, longer queries, uh, and, and as part of the project, there is a uh, and fault tolerance will be implemented. Uh, as a, you know, you add temp temporary storage. You don't stream the data directly between operators, between stages. You have a temporary storage now where you keep the data for the case if something fails. So um, because you keep the data in the storage, you can now apply multi-stage planning because you know you, you, you now know what the data shape is. You know the statistics. So you can, for example, change the join type, change the flip the join sites, for example. Uh, so you can do this uh, planning in a, in a you know, uh, incrementally. This is also a neat technique. Uh, yeah, and there we, we have plans for improved statistics. So there might be cases where there is some there are some outlier values which are very frequent. So you might want to treat them differently. Um, you might want to detect correlation between columns. Another example is that. Uh, if you have partition data in connectors in Lakehouse, like if typically think uh, think like Blue or Hive Metastore keeps statistics per partition, so it's hard to compute the number of distinct values per the for the entire table. Uh, so you might want to apply some uh, extra techniques to be able to compute number of distinct values for the entire table, even though you have just a sample of partitions. Uh, let's say that could be uh, hyperlog log algorithm, for example. Uh, and, and yes, and uh, it's not I mentioned here, but question. Hey, sorry. Um, this is Rebecca Taft from from Cockroach Labs. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, how you're planning to determine correlation between columns. I, I think I remember oh. you said earlier in the earlier in the talk that you currently assume that columns are fully correlated. So does that mean you you basically take the the lowest selectivity predicate of several predicates and just use that as the selectivity of the full predicate? Or, or how are you doing that today? Yeah, and how are you planning to, to change? Yeah, so right now we take the auxiliary clause and the, sorry, um, driving clause and the auxiliary clauses. And we, we uh, try different uh, driving clauses. We take uh, the plan that produces the, le the least amount of rows, uh, as you said. Uh, for the correlations, um, uh, there is the histograms are on the plate, but there, there is also a, a way to, you can compute the uh, things like the Pearson correlation between columns potentially. So, so this is, this is still, you know, in, in the planning. So we will see. Uh, yeah, but so, you know, so how... histograms are expensive essentially, right? So if you want to do computations of your statistics on histograms, Essentially, what you have now is one histogram. If you add uh, 10 histograms, a histogram with 10 values, you multiply your computations by 10, a factor of 10, which might affect the planning times. Right, right. So how, you mentioned um, uh, driving columns and auxiliary columns. Could, could you uh, say again what that means? So uh, for the join statistics, we have a join statistics calculator. Okay, the question is, what's the was the output row count of the join. So if you have more than one equicondition, you pick one, you compute the filtering factor for that, for that equicondition. 
uh, because you know the number of distinct, distinct values, or you should know the number. I mean, you, 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 if you know the number of distinct values for the left and right side of that equicondition, uh, and there, then there are other equiconditions, the, the auxiliary auxiliary equiconditions. So for this, we don't compute filtering factor anymore based on number of distinct values, but we apply the constant uh, coefficient, which is, I believe, uh, 0.9 today, um, with the you know, assumption that if user writes a join where, you, where it has multiple equi clauses, it's, it's usually, usually the equi clauses are correlated, right? That's the idea. Got it, thanks. Okay, so one more thing is that um, we are slowly thinking how to move to the exhaustive optimizer. Um, this is uh, this is uh, this is this is this is tricky, but at some point it will be required. Um, right now, uh, if you add exhaustive optimizer, you have to have good statistics. Uh, always, like maybe not always, but you you. It, it's, it's more important, even more, uh, and you might put some more, it might cost more time to, to uh, choose the bigger plan, to choose the better plan because you evaluate much more combinations. So we, we, will, we, will, we will think about this. So, so yeah, so thank you for, the, for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Okay, I will applaud Carol. We'll have everyone else. Uh, so we have a few minutes for questions. So if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and fire away. All right, screw you guys. I have questions. Awesome. Um, so what do you think any interesting? Oh, wait, sorry. Yes, go for it. Yeah. So this is Hamid. Uh, I had a question regarding the. Do you use any kind of semi join? So you went to the left side and. Uh, you collected something and you push the predicate on the right side, uh, but uh, uh, that can be yeah. actually Bloom filters as well, you know? Yeah, uh, so we could convert dynamic filters into Bloom filter, yes. Uh, this is, again, in federated case, it's, <laughs> it's a little bit trickier because different lake houses, for example, uh, have different format for the Bloom filter. So once, while you collect these Bloom filters at the runtime in the engine, you have to uh, choose between which hashing function you want, for example. Uh, so, so this is this is uh, open door still. Uh, regarding semi-joins, uh, we actually switch to uh, we have a semi join implementation, yes, but we switch to uh, we actually convert semi join to join now to, to inner join now where it's a filtering semi join. So sometimes you have to have a semi join because you want to know the result whether it's true or false that the row is in the in the right in a, in a set. However, if you don't know, don't need to have a result, we actually convert us to inner join, and this has advantages that. We can now such a semi-join node that doesn't really have to be a semi-join can participate in join reordering. The other thing is that we can derive dynamic filters. We actually derive dynamic filters for, for semi-join too, but mainly for the, for the reason of CBO and to join reordering, we try to avoid semi-joins. Yeah, yeah, I got it. I mean, the advantage of Bloom filters is that the amount of data they pass is very, very small. And in fact, you can make that one to be symmetric. It's called zigzag join. That is, you go from the left, form the bloom filter, go to the right, apply it, form another bloom filter, bring it back to the left, and then finish it. Now, most of the rows that you're like retrieving will be in the output because you did it symmetric on both sides. So left teaches the right, and right teaches the left. And yeah, that's a very uh, small amount of data. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's true. So this is like I like I said, <laughs> dynamic filter is a never-ending story. Dynamic filtering, like you you still have a lot yeah. of you can you 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 complete something. There is 
two more two more doors open and you can improve here and there like so so it, it, it's not finished yet i would say yeah okay thank you anybody else so i guess carol i and maybe i missed this like we, the joint learning for that that's that's pretty much the only place we're doing the cost-based optimization like are you doing a sounds like you're doing like a bottom-up approach instead of a top-down approach is that correct uh, we actually do the uh, yeah it's a it's a it's a bottom-up approach i think yes Actually, right. I'll have to think. Uh, like the system actually, the, 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 the recursion is from the top, actually, right? So what we what happens is that we now we, we have a list of source tables, and the algorithm works like that: that it uh, splits the the, the 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 set in two, and then applies joint reordering to the subsets. So it's actually, I think, it's a it's a top down approach. Yeah, it's a top down approach. Yes. Okay. But with memor memorization. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that so, okay. okay. I got one I more mean, question for you, if you don't mind. Yeah. No so have, have you done any comparison with Dremio or, you know, the modern Redshift? Well, well I don't know about Redshift, uh, but we did comparison with Dremio, yes. But you I mean, mean comparison... Uh, Hamid, that, Hamid, that's a loaded question. Like, is it faster? Like, like, what, what do you want them to say? Like, like. Yeah, uh, I think we are fast. Like, uh, we we pushed for the performance uh, recently in the recent quarters, and we had some good gains. So right now, I think uh, I think we are faster. Uh, yeah. Also, Dremio has the problem that. If I recall correctly, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think it runs all of the queries from the TPCH, TPCDS data set. So we cannot fully compare those two products still. So the, the, the Dremio talk is November 22nd, Hamid. So you can come and complain to them. Yes, I know. I know. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so I, I guess I want two quick questions. One is, I mean, you guys are kind of uniquely positioned to have that you have data about the accuracy of the statistics of all these different data sources that you're getting connected you have connectors for like i understand some are like i'm reading from s3 buckets and you know the data files are static but i'm thinking like you're connecting to mysql oracle postgres right all single store all these different database systems out there that, that maintain their own statistics and you're basically trying to extract them out and use yeah. them in your own query optimizer right yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess the fir first question is, do you control when you call analyze on those other systems? Uh, no. Okay. We don't have a, then, we don't do that. I understand. And then, so that means that also across all the different queries that are running on the, you know, the Starburst cloud platform, not the, if someone's on-prem, you don't have access to this, but on the cloud platform, people are probably connecting to everything. So you could then potentially keep track of over time, which of these different database systems are actually have, you know, are, are usually wrong about their statistics? Yeah, I mean, what I think in the direction it will evolve into is that uh, you would have, uh, you would provide, you would um, set up your data sources, but uh, transparently behind the scenes, what will happen is that we will actually, you know, you, you, as a user, you would be able to tell, okay, I want to cache this data, or maybe we cache it for you automatically. So uh, even though, like, because the problem with the relational data sources is that they are often slow. And then sometimes uh, people don't want to have the load on the source database, like their data, right? Because they have other production workloads there. So if they want to offload from, from such databases, they usually want to move to Trino, but in such a way that they can reuse the existing queries. So they, they, they want transparency. Uh, and here comes the technique of materialized view or, or the caching of the results or um, 
what else? Um, okay, so, so so people are using this so the, the federated aspect of Trino to uh, get additional usage out of their existing databases as a as a on trans, uh, on the path toward, towards migrating off of them. Yeah, it is one one typical example is that some typical example is that people want to move from the companies want to move from from the let's say some of the classical databases like you no. Know, that's right. Data, sure. data, right? Postgres, not necessarily, but like this big analytical uh, box, like the fridges. Yeah. Uh, and they, um, but they have production workloads there. So they, they start doing that by plugging Trino first, and then they move workload to Trino. Uh, but as they move workload to Trino, more and more, they put more pressure on, this, on, the, on the source. And they, 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 but they, you know, so we, we want enable, we want to enable them to, you know, to, to move even more work with the Trino, right? So I think they start simple by just connecting your source and then they, you know, apply different, more, more techniques, right? And this is mostly, I guess, for on-prem customers in the cloud. What will happen is that we will manage the, this automatically for the yeah. customer. I I, I'm just making a comment that I think you guys have a very interesting data set. And as a researcher, I, I, I would, if there was something public you could share about that, again, just say, not for any individual customer, across your entire customer base, Teradata has the best stats or, you know, Oracle has the best stats. Like there's one paper that shows who has, you know, who has the best stats for a single node, you know, and a, and a workload, but across all different customers, I think that would be actually super interesting. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, uh, the, the thing is we would have to, the thing is, uh, you have to. Yeah, I mean, but we, we we probably could do that actually. But um, th there is also always a problem of um, co collecting this. Like, does customer allow us to collect this information, right? So on prem it's hard. But in the yeah, cloud, yeah. it could be easier in the future. Yes, yeah, in the cloud. Yes, not on prem. Okay. All right. Cool.